Hey, how's it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward, with the Total Fitness Bodybuilding video chat for Friday, June the 8th. And today, the way this is going to work is I'll be hanging out here for the next hour, answering any questions that you would like to discuss with regards to bodybuilding, fitness, nutrition, any specific challenges that you're dealing with when it comes to building muscle, losing fat, all that kind of stuff. Feel free to post those questions, comments, and feedback in the video chat window, and I'll do my best to help you out in any way that I can. Now, before I get started, I want to do a audio and video check to make sure that you can hear me, make sure that you can see me, and that it's coming through loud and clear. And if you could do that for me, I would really appreciate it. So just bear with me while I get things organized from my end. Uh, you can let me know if you can hear me and see me and of course type in your questions that you would like to discuss and i'll do my best to help you out in any way that i can all right so just bear with me now i get you may hear my son out in the other room they're they're playing there so we, we have some company over and he's having a bit of fun playing so if you hear some squealing and, and laughing and carrying on in the background that's what it is it's my uh my baby boy out there having some fun, which is always nice. Just a second, guys. I get my computer screen set up here. All right. All right. So we have uh, joining us Vagos. Uh, greetings from Greece. AG1185. Greetings from Tennessee. The Red Devil 22. Hey, Lee. How's it going? Doing well. Thank you much. We have Mr. John Doe joining us again, saying things are loud and clear from Springfield, Oregon. Woodyellos, greetings from Bonnie, Scotland. Where day at Doe Alley? What is, is joining us? And he says, what are the two best exercises for back and two for shoulders and two for arms? All right, we'll get into some exercise questions shortly. Uh, Woodyellos joining us, saying loud and clear. Red Devil saying loud and clear. Good, guys. I appreciate all that. I always want to make sure that it's coming through loud and clear because it would be a waste of our time if I was talking to uh, dead air out there. All right, so let's uh, just jump right in here now. I had a question earlier, and this one was one from a uh, uh, one of my Inner Circle Coaching Club members, Stogie. Stogie is his nickname. And he was asking about probiotics versus digestive enzymes, and he wanted to know the difference. And this is a good question because these supplements are very popular, uh, the whole idea of probiotics and digestive enzymes. And it's something that uh, I personally use myself, and I find that they do make a difference. And what you'll find with these is if you have any digestive issues, meaning gas, bloating, uh, indigestion, things where you, you feel that you're not digesting your food optimally. And usually that comes with some physical side effects. Again, the gas, the bloating, uh, you know, constipation, stinky farts, all, all this kind of stuff. And what a lot of it is, is your body is not breaking down and digesting the food uh, and basically making the best use of it. So that's where taking supplements such as digestive enzymes and probiotics can help. Now, the difference is a digestive enzyme uh, is an enzyme that's going to help to break down the actual macronutrients. So there's enzymes for breaking down protein, for carbohydrates, uh, for fat, uh, for lactose. Um, second, now I actually have some ones that I like to use myself are masszymes, digestive enzymes. You pro if you follow my email newsletters, you probably hear me mentioning these from time to time because they are very high quality and high potency digestive enzymes. And they have protease for digesting protein, uh, amylase uh, for digesting carbohydrates, uh, it has lactase for digesting lactose, lipase for digesting fats. So that's what the digestive enzymes are. They help to digest the actual macronutrients so that your body can utilize them and do what they're supposed to do rather than just sitting in your gut and rotting away. Uh, because that's one of the problems, especially when it comes to protein, is it's hard to digest and a lot of times it just sits in your intestinal tract and it doesn't get broken down and absorbed into your system. So the digestive enzymes will help with that. Probiotics, on the other hand, help to populate your gut with good bacteria, 
we're familiar with, you know, bad bacteria, which make you sick, and then the good bacteria, which actually help to improve your health. And that's what the probiotics do. They help to populate your gut with good bacteria. So you can take one or the other and, and reap, you know, uh, benefits from them, or you can take them together and have like a synergistic effect. You know, that's where it's not like one plus one equals two. It's like one plus one equals three or, or even four because you're getting the synergistic effect of the digestive enzymes and the probiotics. So that's what I do personally. I like to take both of them and I find that it's has made a huge difference in my own digestion. And this is what you'll this is something you're going to notice as you get older. Uh, you know, most pe people when they're young, they can e eat whatever they want and there's no no indigestion issues whatsoever. I mean, if, if you're older, as in like 30s, 40s, 50s and beyond, you can probably relate to this. When you were a kid, you could eat anything and there was no such thing as, as indigestion or upset stomach or gas or bloating. It's just you eat, your body digested it. As you get older, it's not quite as efficient. And that's where supplementation of uh, enzymes and probiotics can help to maximize your digestion in order to optimize, uh, you know, the, the quality of the nutrition that you're consuming. So, uh, again, if, if you're interested in those, these are, uh, you can check them out at biomasszymes.com. That's where I pick up mine too. Uh, but like I say, sign up for my email newsletter and I can send you some more information about them there as well. But that's that question from Stogie. Let's see what else we got. Let's move on here. Now we had uh, this question there from where day at dough <laughs> saying, what are the two best exercises for the back, two for the shoulders and two for the arms? Now that's anytime I get these questions, you know, what are the best exercises? It really depends on the individual, what it is you're training for your own individual mobility. You know, what might be a good exercise for you may be a terrible exercise for somebody else and vice versa. What's a good exercise for somebody else might be terrible for you. So, again, it's kind of a generalized question. But when it comes to shoulders, I like to include uh, things that are going to isolate each head of the deltoid. So, you know, you have your, your the front side and rear head of the deltoids. Ideally, you'd want to do some work for all three of those heads of the deltoids, especially the rare delts, because the rare delts more often than not get neglected. The front delts, they're going to get hit indirectly through pressing exercises that you do for your chest, for your triceps. Uh, the rare delts are the ones that more often than not are ignored and neglected. So I would make sure to definitely include some sort of rare delt work. That could be like a reverse uh, fly. It could be like a face pull. It uh, could be some sort of rare delt machine that you have at your gym, but some sort of isolated rare delt work for sure. And then maybe like a compound pressing exercise. If I had to give you just two exercises, that's probably what I would do. Isolated rare delt and then some sort of compound pressing exercise to help add mass to the shoulders. But luckily, we're not limited to two exercises. So, I mean, you can do more. If, if you want a good, well-balanced shoulder workout, it's going to include, you know, Side lateral raises are going to include front raises, isolation for the rear delts, compound pressing moves, as well as probably some shrugging moves for the traps. If you're doing all that, then you're basically hitting all areas of the shoulders for a complete workout. Uh, as far as the back is concerned, there's a lot of things you can do for your back. You have three basic movement patterns. I mean, there, there's probably a lot more than that, but there's three basic ones that come to mind. You have an overhead pulling. You, God darn it, we got the phone ringing. I will let the wife get the phone. Wife, please get the phone. <laughs> she must have it stopped ringing. Okay. Uh, for the back, we have three basic movement patterns. We have overhead pulling. We have a horizontal pulling or rowing, whatever you want to refer to it as. And then you have an extension, something along the lines of like a hyperextension or a deadlift or a good morning type of movement where you're actually engaging the spinal erectors to straighten up your back. Those are the three major movement patterns. So ideally, you'd want to include exercises for all three of those. Some sort of overhead pull, like a lat pull down or a pull up or a chin up. Some sort of horizontal row, either like a barbell row, dumbbell row, machine row, seated cable row, something of a, of a horizontal row and then some sort of back extension exercise, such as a deadlift or a good morning. Uh, those were the, would cover all areas of the back. Again, I know that's not two, but again, I'm trying to give you the optimal situation, not the, the minimalist situation. As far as the arms are concerned, you're gonna get a lot of arm stimulation from training your big major muscle groups of the chest, shoulders, and back. The biceps and triceps and forearms are gonna come into play as secondary muscle groups for all those other 
uh, exercises. But again, you'd want to include an isolation move for the biceps, an isolation for the triceps, and then some direct grip work for your forearms if you want to, to optimize your arm development. But uh, again, ho hopefully that helps to answer your question there. I mean, bottom line, you need to follow, uh, you need to have a bigger picture of your exercises, not just thinking about, you know, what are the one or two best exercises and think of training the entire muscle group and finding the exercises that work the best for you and that you can do based on uh, your mobility and available exercise equipment availability. But anyway, let's move on. Let's kind of bang out some more questions. I know I can get rambling on too long at a particular question and uh, just uh, slows down the flow of the chat. We have Pro Reactor joining us, and he says, how do you feel about intermittent fasting? Have you ever tried it? Yes, I have. I think it is a good strategy for fat loss. Uh, it's also a good strategy for general health and fitness because there's a lot of health benefits that can come about from uh, fasting. It's also good for your digestion. I mean, when you can give your digestive system a break from eating from time to time, uh, it actually works really well because it helps to replenish uh, the good bacteria and, and the digestive enzymes in your body. So intermittent fasting is very effective, but it's not for everyone. If, if your goal is building muscle mass, filling out your frame with muscular body weight, I would not recommend intermittent fasting. If your goal is fat loss and, and or maintaining your weight, then you can look into intermittent fasting as a strategy for doing that. So fat loss or maintenance, yeah, I think intermittent fasting is, is a valuable tool to use. Uh, for weight gain, i.e. lean muscular weight gain, uh, no, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, one thing I will mention before we move on is when it comes to intermittent fasting, a lot of people think that just because they are fasting for a good portion of the day that they can get away with eating whatever they want. Food quality in terms of you know your food choices, uh, following the proper macronutrient split, all that kind of stuff still applies regardless if you're following a, a six meal a day bodybuilding diet or you're following a two meal a day intermittent fasting diet. Th that you still need quality nutrition for the times that you do eat. It doesn't mean that you can get away eating whatever you want. So I mean, don't think, well, I'm gonna just fast all day and then pig out on pizza and burgers at night and boom, I'm all set. I mean, you may get away with, with it in terms of, of weight control because just your overall caloric intake is lower but it's not good for your overall health and fitness. If you want to maximize your health, fitness, and athletic performance, you still need quality nutrition, regardless of what type of diet plan you're following. You know, how, however many meals a day you're eating, the quality of those meals is what's most important. So if I'm coaching somebody personally, I would generally not recommend intermittent fasting as a, a starting strategy. I would rather them get into the habit of eating consistent, high quality meals first, and then if we need to control their caloric intake and, and, and to, to facilitate fat loss, then we can look into reducing the, the, the frequency of those meals in order to help control caloric intake. Because what you'll find is most people can restrict their calories easier and more comfortably by eating fewer meals rather than eating smaller meals. It's, it's, it's very uncomfortable to sit down to the table eat so much food and then leave while you're still feeling hungry. You don't get the, the same level of eating satisfaction and satiety when you have to leave the table hungry. But if you eat fewer meals, you can control your appetite because you're not eating as often, but you can still leave the table feeling comfortably full and satiated. And I find that that is a much uh, easier approach to follow. And it's a longer term approach for most people because it's comfortable. And if you're not comfortable and you can't live with your diet plan, then you're not going to follow it long term. I mean, trying to fo force yourself to follow a temporary diet plan. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it can work in the short term if you have like a short term goal. But if you're looking for long term health and fitness and, and controlling your body fat and body composition, you need something that you can follow as a lifestyle. And that's why you need to follow a program that works for you, your body type and one that you actually enjoy following. If you don't enjoy it, you know, forget it. Willpower is only going to last so long. You need to be able to stick with this for the long term. All right. But uh, yeah, intermittent fasting is definitely a powerful tool when done properly. But again, it's not for everyone. Okay, let's move on. Let's see what else we got. Uh, Orang Zayab, I think. If I'm mispronouncing your name, I do apologize. But I will answer your question nonetheless. 
He says, thanks. Uh, having a gr having a great great regards for you and your work. Respected. Uh, please, uh, kindly, is a Hindu squat 100 for four sets of a total of 400 reps helpful for size development? Yes, Hindu squats or body weight squats. The, the only difference between a Hindu squat and a traditional body weight squat is the Hindu squat is done on your tippy toes. A body weight squat or, or most squats that we do are done flat footed. Hindu squats, which is basically the original squat. If you study some fitness, physical culture literature, everybody squatted on their tippy toes. Most, most of the people did anyway. The whole idea was you'd get on the balls of your feet and you do your squats that way. It was more of a quad isolated exercise. And the idea of squatting flat footed came much later in the whole physical culture you know, era. Now, the thing is, you can squat much heavier and more securely with a flat footed squat than you can with a on the toes Hindu style squat. But bottom line, body weight Hindu squats is an awesome exercise. And it's, you know, you can do that to help increase the size of your legs. Now, I know a lot of people think, well, don't you need progressive overload through weight and, and resistance overload? Well, yeah, you do. But you can still make great progress initially just through sheer volume of training. I mean, if, if you're a deconditioned and you're not working out, doing high volume body weight exercises can make a huge difference. And I'll give you some examples. Look at people who do exclusively body weight exercises, like gymnasts, uh, phenomenal shape. Uh, a lot of traditional martial artists who, you know, before the days of, of weight training did a lot of exclusive body weight exercises and in phenomenal shape. Uh, sometimes you see these guys doing what they refer to as street workouts, you know, where they're at the playground and using just body weight exercises on the equipment, phenomenal shape. So yeah, you can get great results through body weight only exercises. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's no place for uh, resistance weight training exercise either. I mean, you hear that? You hear that? He's out there running around the hallway. there having a, <laughs> He's doing body weight exercises, right? He's not even two years old. And he's doing body weight exercises running up down that hallway and uh, building up his muscles. So there, you can still make good gains with body weight exercises. Bottom line, let's move on. Blue Leaf 1717 says, Lee, which exercises would you recommend for effectively targeting the rear delts? Good question. Uh, some of my favorites. Good stuff, that is. Good, good fresh coffee. Gotta love it. Uh, some of my favorite rare delt exercises. If you have access to a reverse pec deck fly, I like that one. Uh, that's a really isolated machine exercise, but it's good for the rare delts because it takes them through a full range of motion. Very strict and isolated movement. The face pull with either a rope attachment or two handle attachments from a cable pulley. That's another really good one. The face pull is more of an entire upper back exercise. So it's going to target the rear delts, traps, and all the, the muscles of the upper back. So that's a really good one as well. Reverse dumbbell flies, where you would bend over at the waist and do a reverse dumbbell fly for your rear delts, really good one as well. Uh, you can also do those type of movements with rubber fitness bands. And the thing I like about rubber fitness bands is they provide constant tension and it, it's a very strict isolated movement. And it's, it's also kind of therapeutic on the joints because sometimes if you find that free weight exercises cause any joint irritation, a lot of times you can do a similar movement with a rubber fitness band or with a cable and work the muscle without the same joint aggravation and irritation. So it's, it's sometimes good for uh, working around injuries and things like that. But those are some of the best exercises. Uh, I have several videos showing rare delt exercises. So if you go to YouTube and just do a search for Lee Hayward rare delts, you'll see a lot of my videos. I mean, I have some that are probably like 10 years old and, and some recent ones that I've made like within the last several months. So there's a whole selection of rare delt exercises there. Also, if you search for any shoulder workouts, I'm guaranteed that there's going to be at least one rare delt exercise in every shoulder workout that I post as well. So check out those Lee Hayward rare delts or just Lee Hayward shoulder workouts, and you'll see a lot of different uh, variety that you can incorporate there. Mr. John D is joining us, and he says, how often would you suggest to change up a workout routine, or should it remain the same for as long as gains are happening? Uh, the former, it should remain the same for as long as gains are happening. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
So I, I, again, I do apologize for the noise going on in the other room. I got the dog barking. I got the baby running around and squealing. Uh, they're having fun, and I'm in here having fun as well. You know, I enjoy these video chats. Um, anyway, back to the question. Uh, how long should you stick to a workout for as long as the gains are happening? If, if you're making progress, why do you want to change it? Ride that wave of momentum. Follow your workout program until you hit a plateau. And every program you follow is going to go through this cycle. You're going to go through a cycle of uh, adapting to whatever program it is. You're going to go through a cycle of growing in response to that. And then eventually you're going to hit a plateau. And this is inevitable. I don't care if, if it's a program you found on YouTube, it's a program you found on bodybuilding.com, or if it's a program that a personal trainer designed for you, doesn't matter. Every program is going to go through this to some degree. You're going to adapt, you're going to grow in response to it, and it's going to plateau. That's provided you're actually following it consistently. If you're not following it consistent, consistently, then you know it's not going to do diddly squat. But if you're consistent and actually following through with it, you'll go through that cycle. Once you start to hit the plateau phase, and how you'll know you're hitting a plateau is, one, you're probably not hitting the same uh, in terms of your strength gains. You're probably like either struggling to complete the same sets and reps that you were doing pre previously, same sets, reps, and weight, that is, or you're probably even gone to the point where you're starting to lose strength. So you're like, holy crap, I, last week I was bench pressing 200 pounds for 10 reps. This week I'm struggling to get it for eight. You know, and then the following week, gee, I can barely get it for seven, you know, and you're gradually getting weaker and weaker. That's a sign that you hit a plateau and you need to change things up, you know, because your strength is constantly fluctuating. So, I mean, you might hit a peak and then it starts to taper off. Doesn't necessarily mean you're losing muscle. It just means that your body is a, a hit a plateau to that particular style of training. It might be, uh, you know, reaching the borderline of over over training and you may just need to change up the movement patterns change up the exercises in order to help stimulate new muscle growth and maybe even like do a deload phase or whatever but there's a lot of things we can incorporate there but bottom line keep your workouts the same for as long as you're making progress and generally that's going to be six weeks for most people beginners might be able to stretch that out to upwards of 12 weeks more advanced people are probably going to have to change it up more frequently, but it's really an individual thing. You know, you, you can't uh, you can't predict in advance how long a program is going to last for you. So, I mean, go by your own individual progress for this one. Daniel is joining us. Saying, Lee, just wondered if you're doing a lean bulk, what percentage of macros do you use? Um, Right now, I, I would consider myself in a maintenance phase. I'm not really trying to bulk or cut. I'm just kind of trying to maintain. And uh, as far as a macro split that I like to use, I try and consume as close to one third of each macro as I can. Now, in reality, it probably tips the scale in more of a 40% uh, carbs, 30% protein, and 30% and, uh, fat. That's probably closer to it because I, I, I'm... I know I, I consume a bit more than one third of my calories from carbs. Uh, but I, again, I try to keep it fairly well balanced. You know, I, I recommend most people, if, if you're new to nutrition, start with that uh, equal ratio of protein, carbs, and fat. And that rarely goes wrong. I mean, most people respond very well to a well-balanced diet. And then after you've been following that well-balanced diet consistently, if you want to try and tweak some of the ratios a bit, like maybe a little bit more carbohydrates or a little bit more fat or protein, whatever, uh, you can do so. But start off with a good consistent basis of a well-balanced diet. And uh, th that would work for most people. And that applies for whether you're bulking or cutting. I find the well-balanced approach works all around. All you would do is ma manipulate the portion sizes and your total caloric intake to adjust whether you're trying to gain muscular body weight or lose body fat. But that well-balanced approach works really well. Okay, let's see what else. We got the Red Devil 22 saying, I just had sold, I just had shoulder surgery, uh, attendant here. What would you recommend for when I get back to the gym? I would recommend in this situation, if I was in your boots, I would go and work with a physiotherapist, preferably someone who's good at what they do and used to working with athletes or at least used to working with people who are more advanced in terms of their physical fitness. Because when it comes to physiotherapists, you kind of have 
a, a couple different schools. You kind of have your general physiotherapists who are used to working with sedentary people. You know, your, your typical average, old, middle-aged, non-exercising population who get hurt, right? They go out shoveling snow in the wintertime or, or doing some yard work in the summertime and then they, you know, get injured because they're doing some physical activity that their body is totally unprepared for, get injured, and then they have to go see a physiotherapist. Or maybe they got into a car accident or something like that and they hurt their back or their neck or this and that and then they have to go and get that, get rehab for that injury. Then you have... A, more advanced people who are athletes and bodybuilders and, and fitness enthusiasts who are in the gym, they're in good shape and they get injured either due to their sport or, or whatever. So uh, ideally you'd want to work with a physiotherapist who's used to working with the former, people who are athletes, bodybuilders, and people who are physically in shape. And I would get some personalized attention. Let them to size you up, do an examination on you and figure out what that can you can do based on your individual mobility and working within your individual pain threshold i mean you can do some searching online and, and kind of figure out some some good rehab exercises that you can do for your shoulders i mean i have some if you do like especially some of my rotator cuff videos they're cover kind of rehab exercises for the shoulders as well because rotator cuff is a very common shoulder injury and i cover a lot of different shoulder exercises that you can do uh, so if you do a search for like lee hayward rotator cuff you'll find that um, but I, I think you'd be better off to actually just go and, and see a good physiotherapist and get that one-on-one -on -one attention where they can actually work with you, take your body through all the different exercises and mobility drills and see what you are capable of. And hopefully they can suggest some specific rehab exercises that are more suitable to you rather than just trying to wing it or piece something together based on YouTube videos. That's what I would do if I was in your situation. All right, uh, what else? The Dust is joining us, and he says, I've been going to the gym for six months. Can I use your 12-week program? It really depends. If you've been consistently training for six, six months in a progressive overload fashion and not this six months on and off type of thing, you're probably ready for something like that. But I would probably stick to a more well-balanced uh, program, something maybe like, th this is the general recommendation that I have for most people. Start off with a basic beginner's total body workout three days a week. Once that start stops working for you or you get bored with it and you want to progress, then probably do like an upper lower body split. That would be a good way to, to progress from that. Then once that stops working for you, <laughs> once that stops working for you and you're looking to uh, progress from there, then I would recommend maybe like a push-pull legs, three-day bodybuilding split routine. That would be another progressive uh, step up. Uh, from there, you can take it to whatever area you want. I mean, you could probably move into some more specialized bodybuilding programs. You could probably move into some more specialized strength training programs. But that's the, the general recommendation that I have for, for most of my uh, coaching students. Start with the total body, then progress to an uh, upper-lower body split, then progress to a push-pull legs, and then from there we can kind of see where it is you're at and, and what it is that you want to work on. So we can tailor it then towards strength training, tailor it towards bodybuilding, uh, conditioning, sports-specific, wh whatever it is you want from that point on. Uh, but start with the basics first. So if you're still within that six-month range, um, if you haven't done an upper-lower body split, go with that first. If you haven't done a push-pull legs, I'd go with that. And then... Uh, worry about more advanced programs like the 12-week one. We have Love Malhorta, Mal, Malhatra, Malhatra, sorry. Uh, sir, for powerlifting, please give tips. All right. Um, that really depends on how advanced you are. I mean, that's like... That, that's such a broad question, you know, give tips for powerlifting, right? I mean, we, we, we could, people have written books on the topic and there's, there's so much to discuss. So I, I really, I need to know more about you, what it is you're training for and everything else. What I would kind of recommend if, if you are new to powerlifting, I would still recommend going through the, the basic beginner uh, progression that I just mentioned. 
the total body workouts, the upper lower body split, the probably push pull legs, and then you can even get into more specific powerlifting training. And, and the way powerlifters train versus bodybuilders is they generally don't focus on the muscles, they focus on the exercises. So they'll have a bench press day, they'll have a squat day, they'll have a deadlift day. Uh, sometimes they'll even combine the squat and deadlift days together because there's such an overlap between the body parts that are trained. You know, it's both squats and deadlifts work the the back, the hips, the glutes, uh, hamstrings, quads, but it's just to different ratios. Obviously, squats work the legs to a slightly greater degree, deadlifts work the back to a slightly greater degree, but in both exercises, back, hips, and legs come into play. So a lot of power lifters will actually combine squats and deadlifts into the same uh, training session. Um, and then the bench press and the pressing uh, muscles usually come into a separate training session. But th there's so much that we could cover there. Uh, I'll kind of share some of my personal insights. Uh, I've done different powerlifting programs uh, over the years. And, you know, from just some very basic uh, squat, bench, deadlift programs where I just literally did that three days a week. And I find that that works really well for a beginner or someone like coming back after a layoff. Uh, but once you get more advanced with powerlifting, you'll probably benefit from more specialized training. And one that I found very helpful is the West Side Barbell style of training. And this is a very elaborate program. I mean, there, there's a lot of there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, and when you say West Side Barbell, I mean, it, it just like opens up a whole new dimension to training. But bottom line, they focus on alternating dynamic effort work with maximum effort work. So you're going to be doing lighter weight, faster speed, explosive style training for dynamic effort. And then you're going to be doing heavy max effort lifting for your max effort work. Uh, most of us are kind of familiar with max effort. You know, that's like going into the gym, trying to set a one rep max in an exercise. That's max effort. The dynamic effort is kind of like a the untapped category for most people. Very few people purposely train the dynamic effort where you're using uh, sub-maximal weights for maximum speed and explosiveness. Most people do not train that way. And once you add that element into your training, you can really see a massive spike in your strength and explosiveness and power, especially if you've never focused on that. So that's one of the things that I found was a, a huge uh, shift in my own training back when I was training for powerlifting was the addition of the dynamic effort work. So uh, if, if you're not incorporating dynamic effort speed work into your training, that would uh, really give you a boost in your overall uh, powerlifting performance. So what I would recommend if, if you want, just get on uh, like Elite FTS. Dave Tate's website is kind of like the the new uh, taking over from Westside Barbell. Like when I started studying this, um, I was like the old the VHS tapes, the old Westside Barbell VHS tapes with Louis Simmons, and I still have them. And I watched those tapes over and over again. It's a wonder I didn't wear them out. I mean, you know, but I would watch those things over and over again. This was long before the days of YouTube or anything like that. And uh, I got a lot of benefit from those. And then, of course, Dave Tate now with uh, Elite FTS has, has kind of like taken things to a whole new level and really implemented the online uh, aspect of things. But go over there and, and I mean... That you'll find a, a lot of information for powerlifting specific training if that's what you want to focus on. That's where I would recommend you you spend your time. All right, let us move on, folks. I have a quick sip of coffee and we'll answer another question. We have Vegos joining us. He says, "What's the best time of day to take a fat burner?" The best time of day to take fat burner would be on an empty stomach before exercise depending on the fat burner, of course, because some fat burners work best on an empty stomach. Some may require you to have some food in your stomach, depending on what it is that you're actually taking. But more often than not, empty stomach before exercise would be the best time of day. Uh, I'll kind of use myself as an example. Back when I was training for bodybuilding, one of my favorite fat burning stacks was the ephedrine caffeine stack. I would also throw in some green tea extract with that. Uh, you may be familiar with ephedrine, caffeine, and aspirin. Uh, that was kind of like the, the ECA stack, the original one. But after doing a lot of research, um, i.e. Googling, that's what I refer to as my research, uh, I found that I don't want to be taking aspirin on a regular basis. Right? It's, it's 
you know, it has its place, but it's not something that I want to be taking on a consistent basis, day in, day out, week in, week out for, you know, months on end. So I decided to drop the aspirin from it. And quite honestly, I didn't notice a darn difference. The ephedrine and caffeine work just as well without the aspirin addition. So if you are taking the ECA stack, you know, you might want to reconsider it and just take ephedrine and caffeine. Uh, I would also add in green tea extract. Now, green tea extract has its own health and uh, fat burning benefits, but it also helps to prolong the effects of the ephedrine and caffeine as well. So I would take that as my fat burning stack of choice. And I would have that first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. And then I would go do some cardio, you know, walk for an hour, cycle for an hour, go to the gym, use cardio machines for an hour, whatever. But I usually start my day with an hour of cardio when I'm in full on fat burning mode. And then later in the afternoon or early evening, I'd go to the gym and do a weight training workout. And I would take that uh, same stack, ephedrine, caffeine, green tea extract again before the weight training. Take it both on an empty stomach. And I found that it helped to curb my appetite, which is a huge benefit. It would boost my energy levels, another huge benefit. And it also helps to stimulate thermogenesis and actually aid with fat burning. But the, the appetite suppression and the energy boost is, is a huge plus because when you're on a low calorie diet, you definitely, you can benefit from that as an assistance, as basically like a crutch to help you get through the dieting and the training that you're doing. Now, the, the, the fat burners are not going to do the work for you, right? I don't want you to think that, oh, I can take fat burners and eat whatever the hell I want. No, it doesn't work that way, but they will help make the process a little bit easier. So if you're already following a strict diet, you're already doing all the, the hard work in the gym and you add in the fat burners, it can help make the process a little bit easier. And it's just like a little crutch to uh, to assist you with your fat burning diet rather than, uh, you know, having to rely on willpower alone. Because if you have a bit of appetite suppression from a fat burning snack, it makes it so much easier to stick with your diet. You know, if, if you've got a bit of an energy boost, makes it that much easier to grind through a hard workout. So that's where I would use the fat burners. And I found that that to be the most effective. Okay, let's move on. We have Tick in at all. Tick in at all? I don't know. Tick, tick in at all? <laughs> I'm getting tongue tied. And he says, Lee, uh, keep reading that protein intake should be one gram per pound of body weight. For me, that would be 185 grams. How can I get that without exceeding my calories for the day? That is a good general rule of thumb. Now, some people say you don't need that much proteins, others say you need more, but you know, that one gram per pound of body weight is a good average for most people. If, if you really want to get nitpicky and, and anal about it, you can go one gram of protein per pound of lean body weight. So you actually calculate your lean mass and fat mass and just consume one gram per pound of lean mass if you want to be really picky. But, you know, to keep it simple, one gram of protein per pound of body weight works very well. Where you're going to make the reductions is in your carbohydrate and fat calories. So if you need to reduce your caloric intake, cut back on your carbs, cut back on your fat, and keep your protein intake high. That's kind of like a basic model for a fat-burning diet, and it works really well. Because the protein is going to help to maintain and build lean muscle tissue. Uh, if you keep your carbs and fat lower, I'm not saying you have to eliminate them, but just reduce them. If you do that, reduce them, then that's going to help to encourage your body to tap into burning more stored fat for energy. I mean, if you have an abundance of, of carbs and fat in your diet, then you're not going to be resorting to burning stored body fat for fuel. You need to make some reductions there. And uh, keeping your protein high uh, actually works in your favor because protein is not an ideal energy source for the body. It, it takes a lot of energy to digest and assimilate protein versus carbohydrates and fat but it's, your body is more likely to use that for recovery and growth rather than uh, using it for energy. Now, in extreme situations, your body can break down protein, convert it to glucose and use it for energy, but that's in like extreme situations. For, for most people following a normal you know, fat burning diet, uh, that's not gonna happen. You're gonna be resorting to the carbohydrates and fat consumption as well as your stored body fat for energy. Okay, 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 let's see what else we got. Uh, Skylar's got a question asking about the conjugate method while cutting. You know what? You can pretty much follow any strength training, weight training style program, whether you're bulking or cutting. 
Um, and, and a prime example of this, you look at a lot of strength athletes who are trying to make a weight class. They're still training, you know, doing their, their structure strength training programs on a lower calorie diet in order to make their weight class. They don't change up to this whole, you know, high reps for cutting, low reps for bulking type of bull crap. <laughs> you know, they don't follow that. They're still following a structured strength training program, regardless if they're trying to gain mass or lose body fat. Uh, so again, the, the conjugate method, if you want to use that while cutting, you certainly can. If you want to follow any other type of program, you know, just a traditional progressive overload program or whatnot, it really, the, the training doesn't change. What changes when you're cutting is the, the addition of diet and cardio. That's what changes. But the strength training is always going to be trying to build muscle, increase your strength. That does not change. Uh, so, so, again, you can follow pretty much any style of, of training. It's the diet and the cardio that's going to be manipulated for fat loss or lean mass gain. We have Sketch J1. Hi, Lee. I seem to have more muscle development on my right side than on my left side, particularly my delt and lat. I also feel a much better mind-muscle connection on that side and get more of a pump. All right. This is very common. Most people, if you were to break out the tape measure and measure your left, right limbs, most people are going to have an imbalance. Uh, I have an imbalance myself. Um you know, and, and it's not always just due to sheer size or strength. Sometimes it's actually in the quality of the muscle. Uh, sometimes like one side might get more defined than another. One have more like dense muscularity than another. And you'll even see this like in bodybuilding competitions when they're calling out the side poses like side chest or side tricep. A lot of times the judges will say your best side chest, your best side tricep. And, you know, uh, even like abdominal and thigh, you have the choice of which uh, thigh to place forward. So most bodybuilders have one side that is better or worse than the other. This is very common. Uh, what you can do to try and correct it, there's, there's several strategies. One is more single limb training where you're actually doing exercises for each individual side. Uh, if you go on my YouTube channel, uh, the main Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel, open up the playlists. I have a full single limb workout routine posted there where every single exercise is a single limb exercise for a complete uh, workout split. So your chest, your back, your shoulders, your arms, your legs, everything is single limb exercises. That would be a good place to start. You could follow that and that would help to balance out the, the imbalances between your left and right sides. You can also do some extra isolation work for your weaker side. So, for example, if, you know, uh, you, you're doing a chest workout, for example, well, what, what were your body parts again? Delts and lats. Okay, you're doing a shoulder workout. After you finish your shoulder workout, you can do some, uh, you know, maybe one arm lateral raises uh, and one arm, uh, you know, isolation work for your weaker delt. Same with your lat. You know, you can do one arm pull downs, one arm rows, things like that for your weaker lat. You can throw that in as an add-on after uh, your 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 regular workout routine. That's another way to help prioritize and to balance out uh, the left and right sides. Another thing that you can look into as well, and this is kind of outside the box thinking a bit, but uh, just in your day-to-day -day tasks and chores, try and switch hands whenever possible when doing some of your regular mundane things. Like for example, if um, you're carrying your, your knapsack or your laptop bag or whatever. If you always carry it in your right hand, that's just like you don't even think about it. You just pick it up with your right hand. Try doing it with your left hand. You know, carry that laptop bag or whatever with your left hand. Uh, if if um, When you're brushing your teeth, if you always brush your teeth with your right hand, try brushing your teeth with your left hand. Uh, when you go to open the door, if you normally reach for the doorknob with your right hand, try consciously reaching with your opposite hand. And even though these things are not going to be direct muscle stimulation, or at least very, very little, because there's no you know, resistance, but what it is, is it's building a better mind-muscle connection with your non-dominant side. So, I mean, just try it. You know, after you, the next time you go brush your teeth, if you normally brush with your right hand or left hand, whichever it is, try doing it with the opposite hand. And it'll feel so weird. You'll be like, oh man, this is weird, you know, and trying to brush your teeth and stuff. But again, you're, you're triggering new motor patterns and you're helping to contribute to a better mind muscle connection with that non-dominant side. And if you do this over time, 
uh, that will help to create a better mind muscle connection, which will carry over when you're actually doing your weight training workouts in the gym as well. So it, it's, again, it's a bit outside the box thinking, but try it. I mean, it's, it's not going to be like an overnight success. It's not like, okay, I brush my teeth with my, op, my, my wrong hand and then boom, now I have perfect, well-balanced biceps or something like that. No, it's not going to work that way. But if you do it over the long term, over the course of several weeks and several months, you will notice a difference. Uh, another thing that you might want to look into if you have muscle imbalances is visit a chiropractor and probably see if you have any alignment issues when it comes to your, your, your spine, your neck, and everything else. Because all the nerves that run down through your neck and your spine and everything else, that plays an impact as well into how the degree of mind-muscle connection you get. Uh, so if you need to, maybe go get an alignment from a chiropractor. might be worth looking into, especially if you've never done it before. And uh, that may indirectly help with getting a better mind-muscle connection and more muscle activation between the left and right sides. So those are some strategies that you can uh, look into trying. And uh, please let me know. If, if you do try any of these, let me know how they work for you. All right. So I'll answer a few more questions before we clue it up. Uh, Andrew is joining us. Andrew Woodcock. And he says, Lee, how is Harvey doing and how is fatherhood? Doing good, I'm sure, as you can probably hear on the video chat. He was running around squealing and having fun there. Uh, so he's doing great, growing like a weed. And it's it's quite an adventure. That's all I'm going to say. Fatherhood is quite an adventure. It's I have a whole new level of respect for parents after becoming one myself. I mean, yes, intellectually, I knew it was going to be a lot of work and, and take a lot of time and all that. But until you actually do it, you don't fully understand it. So I have, I, I tip my hat. I have a whole new level of respect for all you parents out there who are raising kids or who have already raised your kids. I mean, it, I, it, it's, it's a, it's just a, a monumental challenge, but it, it's, it's a, it's a labor of love. That's the way I'm going to put it. It's a labor of love. So it's something I definitely am so happy and fortunate that I am a father, but uh, it's certainly well, opened my eyes to, you know, another dimension of life for sure. No longer am I am I the these this have the same level of I guess of uh, selfishness that I did before. Not that I really consider myself a selfish person, but you know we we I'm not the priority anymore. You know there's there's somebody else who is now takes priority over everything else, and it's it really does change your perspective on life. All right, let's move on. We have another question here. This one is from Nyrese Speck. It says, Lee, I'm 338 pounds. Is it possible to lose weight and gain muscle while I'm in a deficit? Also, will this will be my first year of training. Yes, you can definitely gain lean muscle mass while you're losing body fat, especially as a beginner, especially as someone who is overweight. Uh, because what's going to happen is you're going to be burning that body fat and, and the, the calories that you're getting from the stored body fat are going to help to fuel your workouts. And it's also going to aid with muscle growth as well. I mean, you got all this stored energy on your body, all this, you know, the excess weight that you're carrying. You're going to be utilizing that as, as energy in the gym. And through the gym workouts, you're going to be stimulating lean muscle growth. Uh, and so, I mean, you can do a, a total recomp here, gain muscle while losing fat simultaneously. Um, if you would like some specific help with this, because I know it, it can be a bit overwhelming, especially when you're starting off and you, you know, you, you kind of feel like you're behind the eight ball because you got all this extra weight, you know, you, you know, and you want to lose it and you want to do the right thing. If you would like some help with this, uh, I invite you to contact me personally, because this is something that I really specialize in is helping people with the customized nutrition and training program and doing so in a smart, gradual, progressive fashion. Because one of the problems that most people run into when it comes to uh, starting their first year of training, especially if they have a lot of weight to lose, is finding that balance of how to start off small and build up gradually and avoiding injury and burnout in the process. Because so many people try and do too much too soon. And yeah, you can make a lot of progress if you just dive head first and you know you're doing all kinds of cardio and workouts and really low calorie diet and, and basically per pushing yourself to the extreme. You can make progress in the short term, but it's not a long term approach because eventually you're going to start to burn out. You can only do so much before your body 
uh, st starts to suffer the consequences. So you need to manage yourself and do just enough to start moving yourself in the right direction and then increase that as you need to. Rather than taking the approach of saying, I'm going to starve myself and eat as, as few calories as possible, I'm going to do as much exercise as possible and, and try and lose the weight as fast as possible, that is not a long-term sustainable approach. You're much better off taking a more conservative approach of eating as much food as you can while still allowing your body to burn body fat, doing the least amount of exercise you can while still allowing your body to build muscle and burn fat. And that gives you room to progress as you, as you go along your journey. If you start off doing everything you possibly can right off the get-go, then where are you going to progress once that starts to plateau or when you need to make some you know, adjustments? You don't leave yourself any wiggle room. Whereas if you have a more conservative approach, you, you're leaving yourself some room to modify and adjust as you go. So it's, it's a different school of thought, but it's, it's better for long-term progress. So again, if you would like some help with this, uh, shoot me an email or you know, go to my website, shoot me a, an email through there, and I would be more than happy to uh, assist you with this. Uh, Jonathan is joining us and he says, can you go, can you go over low carb and carb cycling and how long can you do low carb for a 200 pound man? How many carbs would you recommend for bulking? All right. I can go over a, a, a general overview. All right. Where do we begin? Let's start with, we, be, we begin with a sip of coffee. Let's make that two sips. Ah, there we go. All right. If you're new to fat loss, I mean, first off, low carb, most people are going to follow a low carb diet when they're training for fat loss. So if you are new to fat loss, I would not recommend starting with a low carb diet. Start with a well-balanced approach. You know, one third protein, one third carbs, one third fat. Now, Depending on your current diet, that may actually be a lower carb diet than what you're used to because most people eat a lot more than a third of their calories from carbohydrates. So start with the well-balanced approach. Uh, focus on being consistent with your weight training, consistent with your cardio, and try and just optimize the basics. Don't get overly complicated and thinking, oh, I need some advanced carb cycle, rotation, keto, blah, blah, blah. No, you don't need any of that crap. You need to master the basics. Once you have the basics in place and you're consistently following it, chances are you're going to start losing fat, improving your strength and energy, making progress just from doing the basics consistently. Once the basics done consistently starts to plateau, which it will eventually, once that starts to happen, then we can look into more advanced strategies such as maybe like a, a carbohydrate cycle diet to help uh, encourage uh, more fat loss, optimizing your metabolic hormones and encouraging more fat loss. How I generally recommend a carb cycle diet for most people is I go through a high, medium, low, high, medium, low, and I rotate that cycle. So let's say we're going to do two high carbohydrate days. Uh, a sample of how I would do this for most people is we'd have carbohydrates with every single meal along with some protein and, and veggies and healthy fat. So every meal is going to be a big, well-balanced meal, you know, serving a protein, serving a carbohydrates, uh, serving a veggies and some healthy fat every single meal. On the low carb, sorry, on the medium carb days, I would have a couple medium carb days in there right after the high carb days. And these would be carbs after exercise. So if you do, say like you're doing a cardio session first thing in the morning and some weight training in the afternoon or vice versa, you would uh, be able to have a high carb meal after exercise, but all your other meals would be a low carb meal, meaning just protein, vegetables, and some healthy fat. Uh, on your low carb days, I would have those structured after the medium carb days. They would be no starchy carbohydrates whatsoever and just based on protein, veggies, and healthy fat. And I would go through that rotation over and over again. Uh, you can even line it up with the days of the week if you find that that works better for you. I know like a lot of people like to have high carb weekends because that tends to be their, their time for, you know, you, you, if you work a Monday to Friday job, okay, you're off on the weekends, you probably want to eat more food or you're, you're more likely to go to a family dinner or something along those lines, which is going to entail higher carbs, higher calories. 
So uh, a lot of people like to structure their high carbs, high calories phase during the weekends, and then probably have their lower calorie, lower carb days during the weekdays when they're busy working and doing their thing. Uh, so, I mean, you can certainly manipulate the days according to however works best for your schedule, but you go through that rotation, high carbs, carbs with every meal, medium carbs, carbs after exercise, low carbs, no starchy carbs whatsoever, and go through that in a rotation. That's how I recommend it for most people. And you go through that rotation regardless of your exercise split. So I don't care if, if you're training legs on a low carb day or if you're having a rest day on your high carb day or whatever. Just, just let your workouts fall where they may be. And the reason for that is because there's, there's advantages to both training in a high carb state as well as in a low carb state. Uh, so you, you just let the days fall as they may be and you can actually reap the benefits of, of both scenarios. Because sometimes when you do a very high intensity workout in a low carb state, then you're going to tap into burning so much more stored body fat during that workout. Granted, your, your muscles may be a little flatter and you're probably not going to be able to lift as much weight or whatever, but you'll, you'll uh, benefit because you're burning more body fat. And of course, you wouldn't be following this low carb diet unless your main goal is burn body fat in the first place. So that's an advantage. Vice versa, if you were to do a heavy high intensity workout on a high carb day, well, then you can piggyback off the fact that you got all this extra carbs and glycogen in your system. You'll probably be able to train heavier. So, you know, there, there are some strategies where we can um, tweak your workout split to coral to to line up with the carb rotation. Like sometimes I'll have people uh, train their weakest body parts during or right after a high carb phase so they can maximize uh, the benefits, the muscle building benefits towards their stubborn body parts. But for, for the average person, most people, I just kind of like let it fall as it may if if. Let your carb rotation flow uh, separately from your workout rotation. And it doesn't really matter if you, you know, train whether you're in high carb, low carb, or medium carb. Just go through the cycle in that order. And it works really well. Uh, I've followed that rotation myself getting ready for bodybuilding shows. I've taken numerous coaching students through that rotation, uh, especially competitive bodybuilders. And it works really well for the majority of people that I've used this with. All right, let's move on. We have Bill a Bo 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 Bongan, Bill a Bongan, Bill a Bongan, Bill a Bongan. <laughs> Haley, I get bored of following a program. Is it necessary to track workouts, or can I just go and do whatever I like as long as I just hit each muscle group twice a week? Yes and no. Anything you do is better than nothing. So, I mean, if, if you have no structured program and you're just going into the gym and doing whatever the heck you want, that's better than not going to the gym at all. <laughs> so, uh, I, I can relate to that. I mean, sometimes I like to just have fun and, and wing my workouts and kind of go in there and, and do what I feel like doing. Uh, so, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you're trying to optimize your progress, it's probably not the best way to go about it. If you're kind of like in a maintenance or a deload phase, uh, there's nothing wrong with just winging your workouts, right? You know, you, you, you can do that. If you're really trying to maximize your progress and you're training for something specific, be it a sporting event, be it a bodybuilding competition, a powerlifting meet, getting ripped for the beach this summer or whatever, you have some specific goal in mind, preferably like some sort of short or medium term goal, and you want to maximize your progress towards that goal, then having a structured program is, is definitely going to help. It's going to help to maximize your progress versus just going in there and winging it. But if, if you're not really training for anything in particular and you just kind of like want to enjoy yourself and, you know, make some gains, but mostly as long as you're maintaining your fitness and, and having fun, uh, then yeah, you can kind of go in there and just wing it. So th there's not a right or wrong answer. It really depends on you and what it is that you're training for. Wayne is joining us and he says, Lee, I ordered the hand grippers from your website. How long do they usually take to ship? Uh, that depends on where you live. If you're within the United States, I would say you'll get them within a week. Uh, if you're within Canada, God knows, because Canadian customs can be a bitch sometimes. And I'm speaking from experience because I live in Canada. Uh, just to let you know, the grippers are shipped from the United States. I have a, 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 a warehouse 
the down in Colorado that handles it. So the, even though you're ordering from me, they're not shipped from Canada. They're shipped from the United States. So uh, the, the grippers, if you're in the United States, you'll get them within a week. If you're in Canada, usually a couple weeks, but if customs decides to be crooked, then it could take, you know, three weeks, sometimes a month. Uh, when you're dealing with customs, it's really hard to know. And the same would apply for international orders. You know, sometimes they'll arrive within a couple weeks if things go smoothly. Sometimes it could take upwards of a month. And unfortunately, we have no control over that because, you know, when customs gets a package, it could be sitting on their shelf for God knows how long before they get around to finally, you know, scanning it and processing it. Uh, but again, the good thing is, is if you're ordering domestically, you'll get them in less than a week. Sanjay is joining us and he says, Lee, I hurt my back about three months ago while I was trying to push my car out of the snow. And now I have gone to the doctor and am just a second. His question got broke up. Where's the rest of it? Uh, gone to the doctor and they say it's a muscle spasm. I've gotten x-rays as well, but they show nothing. All right. If it's just muscular, that's actually a good sign because if there's no tendon detachments or anything damaged that way and it's just muscle, muscle can regrow and usually regrow normally again. Tendon and ligament detachments and, and stuff like that don't always recover properly. So if it's just muscular, you're probably in, in, in a good state because that will recover with time. Three months, you should hopefully have seen some significant improvements over the course of three months. Uh, but what I would recommend anytime you're training around an injury is you still want to train the muscles that have been injured and still do so with, you know, your regular exercises. So in this case, you know, you're still going to do all your back exercises, pull downs, rows, deadlifts, hyperextensions, whatever. But you're just going to use very light weight, kind of go through the motions for those exercises and work within your pain threshold. Uh, I, I mean, even if you have to start off just doing exercises with the empty barbell, like deadlifting the empty barbell, you know, rowing the empty barbell, doing lat pull downs with, you know, very lightweight on the weight stack and just go through the motions. And then if that feels good next week, you know, increase the weight by five pounds, go through the motions again, if that feels good, increase the weight by five pounds, go through the motions again, and just keep making these little tiny incre incremental jumps week by week. And over the course of several weeks and several months, uh, you should be back up to your previous level of training. But the key is to listen to your body and work within your pain threshold. If you start to do an exercise and it hurts, causes like a sharp shooting pain or discomfort, then that's not good. <laughs> that's a sign that you either shouldn't be doing that exercise or you're trying to do too much too soon. And you know you, you would definitely want to stop whatever it is that causes pain and discomfort. But as long as you can work within your pain threshold, uh, it's okay to train frequently and train in a progressive overload fashion, but just do it slowly and smart. And, you know, with within time, again, it, it, the recovery time is going to vary depending on the degree of the injury. Uh, when I tore my lat tie-in area, of, of, oh, geez, it's 10 years ago now, but when I tore that muscle, it took me a year before I was back to normal, but that was a full-on tear, you know, where there was detachments and stuff. If you just got a pull or a strain, that should recover much quicker. All right, let's move on. I'll answer one more question, then I'm going to clue it up. I know I'm, I've gone on a little longer than an hour, which I usually do. <laughs> All right. I, I got to make time because I'm going to be doing a, a sponsors only video chat as well, where it's actually a smaller group of people and we'll be able to really dive in deep with the with individual discussion. So uh, if, if you're interested, if, if you enjoy these video chats and you would like to have a more um, intimate back and forth discussion, not just me answering your one time question and moving on. Uh, then I would recommend that you consider sponsoring the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel because you'll get some really cool rewards and perks. And one of those is a private sponsors only video chat uh, where I'll have a much more one on one. Well, it's not necessarily going to be one on one because it all depends on who else shows up, but it'll be a much smaller group chat. You know, we might only have a half a dozen people joining us versus, you know, 30 or 50 or whatever it is, right? Uh, okay. Um, where was I? <laughs> All right, we had the injury from Sanjay. Um, let me see. Uh, 
where was it? There's one more question there that I'm going to answer. Actually, I'll just I'll just randomly pick one from the group. Um, Taurus has got a question. This is going to be the last one for the day. So, uh, Taurus says, Lee, I've done every bicep exercise known to man, but I cannot get my biceps to grow, but they have gotten stronger. Please help. The fact that they've gotten stronger is a good sign, and it actually means they have grown. A stronger muscle is a bigger muscle and vice versa. Now, you probably don't have the shape and peak and separation that you're hoping for. And when it comes to biceps, th this, this applies to all muscle groups, but it's very noticeable with biceps because that's kind of like the show-off muscle. Uh, when it comes to biceps, your tendon insertion plays a big role in whether you have a short, high-peaked bicep or a longer, flatter bicep or something in the middle. Uh, you, you'll see some guys, like, who, who when they flex, they got that really high baseball peak bicep. It's just like there's a baseball stuffed under the skin. That's a, a short tendon insertion. So that gives, you know, the, the tendons insert further up on the elbow. So when they flex, it really gives the muscle that high peak look. Other people have the longer tendon insertions, longer down the elbow. And when they flex, it doesn't give that, that big peak look, but it's just a longer, fuller, flatter bicep. If you want to see some examples of this in like real time, or not, not real time, but re real world examples is what I mean. Do a search for like Arnold Schwarzenegger front double bicep and Sergio Olivia's front double bicep. Sergio had the longer, flatter bicep. Arnold had the shorter, high peaked bicep, especially Arnold's right bicep. That was even, that was his best bicep. Uh, but again, you look at the difference, Sergio, the longer, the flatter, Arnold had that short, high peaked bicep. And these are two former Mr. Olympias. So, you know, these guys have done every exercise imaginable, at least up to that point in, in time. And if, if a Mr. Olympia, you know, can't change the, the shape of his biceps, then the chances of, you know, the average mere mortal doing it is like slim to none. Unless you're looking at, you know, surgically enhancing them or using that site enhancement oil crap, which I definitely would not recommend. Um, but that that's it. It really comes down to genetics, how your biceps are going to develop. But you can train, you can still make progress and change them through training. And if you're getting stronger, that's a good sign. Another thing that's going to help as well, body fat. A lot of people don't think of it, but you store fat all over. And if you have extra body fat in your arms, that's going to hinder the shape and definition of your biceps. So the leaner you get, the more defined your biceps are going to look. And if you look at like an off-season bodybuilder versus a pre-contest dieted down bodybuilder, you'll see their arms look they probably look bigger and more defined when they're dieted down. But if you actually wrap the tape measure around them, chances are they're actually smaller because, you know, the, the, the fat and the thicker skin of the off season adds circumference to the arms, but it doesn't make the arms look impressive. Whereas when you're dieted down, the, th the skin is thin and you have that muscularity and definition and detail, it makes them look bigger and make them pop and have that more impressive look. But again, the, the circumference will be smaller. So that's another thing. You can build the muscle through strength training workouts. You can lose the body fat through diet and cardio. Uh, but other than that, man, there, there's really not a whole lot you can do about it, right? I mean, you could certainly change up your workouts and try different training modalities. And I still encourage that, you know, but ultimately it really comes down to genetics. All right, guys, I'm going to get ready and clue it up. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. I really enjoy these video chats with you every Friday, and uh, I'll be doing another one next Friday. So, uh, you know, actually, hold on. Next Friday, I am at, uh, heading out of town next Friday, so there won't be a video chat next Friday. I just remembered that one. Next Friday, June 15th, I'll have to postpone it. So I'll make a notification up there to let everybody know so you're not there sitting around on Friday afternoon like, when the heck's Lee going online? Because next Friday, I'm heading out of town, so I won't be able to do it. But we'll pick it up the following Friday, which is June the 22nd. So again, thanks again so much for tuning in. I really enjoyed it. And uh, hopefully you got some benefit from it. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel so that you can stay up to date with all my videos. And if you would like to support the channel and get some extra content, please consider sponsoring the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel as well. Every bit of help counts, and I'll make it worth your while by throwing in some extra perks and rewards, such as a sponsors-only live video chat, workout of the month program, and you get to choose exclusive content for future videos. So if you would like to help support and be a part of the channel, 
please consider sponsoring it. And I would appreciate all the help and support. And like I say, I'll make it worth your while. All right, guys, have yourself a good one. Take care. Talk to you soon.